So, hi, uh, we're here with uh, Volker uh, um, Hil Hilsheimer and Pedro Vesa from the Q company. And uh, they will be presenting a keynote, the Academy 2022, with the title Building the Future of Cute Together, which sounds extremely interesting, of course. Uh, but we will not be talking about that topic here, as we don't want to spoil the talk. Um, but as we have the rare privilege of having both of them here, we will be finding out more about themselves, how they got started, their role in the cute company, their views of the community, um, and, and things like that. Uh, just to get things rolling, can you could you introduce yourself and explain what you do at the cute company, Pedro Volker? Shall we start with you, Pedro? Sure thing. So I'm the community relations manager at the Q company. Uh, I started in this position in March this year, 2022. So it's been six months. Um, yes, in two days, it's my six month mark. And uh, so far, I've been taking care of planning and building the community strategy, which is basically analyzing and aligning on the resources and personnel we have in order to make sure that we are providing enough support, that we are really nourishing the relationship with our community. And by community, I mean our focus right now is the open source community. Yeah. Volker. All right. Yeah, I'm Volker Hilsheimer. I'm in our Oslo office here in the Qt company. Not today, but uh, in principle, I'm in Oslo. I am one of the area leads in, in our R&D organization. So our R&D organization in the, R in the Qt company right now is about 150 people, I would guess. It's a bit hard to say. Um, and we are organized in different areas that are responsible for different parts of our development efforts. A large part of that is obviously working on Qt, where we have a couple of areas. Um, and one of those areas is graphics and UI, which is a bit of a misnomer because there are a lot of things underneath that uh, umbrella that are not really graphics or UI, um, but very strong, for instance, focus on, on platform work. Um, WebAssembly, for instance, development is happening in that area. So I'm the lead of that area. We are about... 30 people in that area today um, in different teams, um, anything from graphics um, enablement, putting pixels on the screen, sloppily said, um, to building the UI components on top of that and integrating that with um, the different platform layers underneath. Um, being in Oslo and being an area lead makes me one of the senior managers on the site. So I also look a lot at, uh, at the site itself supporting HR and, and my manager colleagues with uh, different things, organizing events, um, reaching out to the schools and universities, for instance, is something we are doing right now quite a bit, um, recruiting. Um, yeah. I have been with the cute company now since October 2018 again. My history in, in Qt starts uh, a little bit in the darker history of, of the world. Uh, we can talk about that a bit separately, I guess. You've been in the cute company forever. I read <laughs> your curriculum. It goes way back. Okay, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, uh, I would, well, actually, we're going to talk about that now. But let's talk. Uh, I mean, I would like to know about your origin stories. Normally, when 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 I interview people who are into technology, they all can pinpoint the moment in their life where they suddenly uh, something went off in their brains and they decided that they loved computers and stuff like that. You know, it's when my dad brought me a Commodore 64 back in 1982 or when I discovered, et cetera. Um, uh, and then there's another moment in, in the life of most technologists when they discover open source. They can also pinpoint that moment. It's when I discovered that Perl was, I don't know, something. So I would like you to tell me about that. What is... What was that moment in your life when you discovered that you know this was going to be the love of your life, the uh, doing stuff with computers? You, Pedro, start you, like you can go alphabetically. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, my story is quite different, quite different trajectory. But well, I grew up with computers already, so I remember being I don't know maybe eight when I got my first computer I mean, it was the family computer and um i mean it's just i guess for my generation we we grew up with it and we do not see our lives without it but i guess mm -hmm. also with time um you end up trying to uh you know you have other necessities and then you start to get a little bit more 
resourceful when it comes to your needs with technology. And uh, I remember encountering a lot of those programs that would be quite expensive to acquire or to pay for their licenses and so on. Mm -hmm. And then you, example, I remember that I found out, sorry? For example? For example, um, Microsoft um, Word. Office. Yeah, well, okay, Where, right, right, right. Excel, all of those. And then I remember that, I guess that was probably my first contact with open source, um, LibreOffice and so on. But right. also, uh, a few years later, uh, I went into like, you know, test and experiment with Photoshop and this kind of things. And um, also quite expensive to acquire that, especially if you're like 13. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. But then there were actually some open free options out there. Um, and well, with time, you know, uh, I guess my trajectory has more to do with community on the community side of things. I was mm -hmm. playing games here and there, and um, I had quite uh, a few different jobs in my life. But when I was living here in Germany, I got a job as a community manager uh, with which I really kind of fell in love with, and I really, I really liked it. So dealing with different stakeholders and getting projects and tackling them and making things work for, for the community is really the thing that I really liked uh, about my day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. And um, so to continue my career, I kind of decided to get away from games and um, try to get into something a little, bo a little bit more maybe resourceful or the, would be a little bit more focused, right? Because when you work with games, it's quite um, quite hectic and it's quite nice, but at the same time, you're always working with a different game. You're always working for a different pro project. So maybe you start doing something, but you never see the result of it. Not ever, but sometimes you don't see the result of it because you just jump to another project and then you just jump to another one. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I saw the opportunity to work at a cute company, I thought it was a really nice one because uh, we already have a community there and there were so many things that I saw that we could do uh, for the open source community that really drove me to apply and start working there. So, yeah, I guess Volca's trajectory will be, was, is quite different than mine from mine. Yeah. So, yeah, Volker, tell us. <laughs> yeah. Yes, my jump into technology, my, my, my defining technological awakening. Um, I did not wake up in a very technologically sophisticated environment, little village in Germany, parents that don't necessarily have much use for computers and so forth. Um, I got my first computer, which was an, an, a Commodore, um, not C64, but rather a, a Commodore PC, actually, running MS-DOS and that kind of stuff. Um, in the late 80s uh, for my 14th birthday because um, my my mother in particular was far-sighted enough to understand that understanding how computers work and so forth is, is uh, going to be quite uh, quite an advantage uh, for future career and so forth. And um, I really dug into that uh, machine um, and uh, programmed it. I had a nice printer, a needle printer, 24 needles, high quality stuff. So I I, uh, I went through the book on how to program that printer and, and control the different needles and so forth. I didn't understand anything of what I was doing, um, but uh, at least I got some some stuff printed and I, I started to write some little software pieces in GW Basic um, on MSOS back in the days. And I started um, having a summer job at a, a local computer consulting company, basically, um, where they had problems with some database. So. Um, I helped them with writing a little, I think it was also basic program that changed the naming to the correct capitalization in their customer database. So that was a testing in production um, back in the days. Um, at school, then learning Pascal and that kind of thing, working working on small software projects, working on my, my uh, exam thesis, so to speak, in, in school as far as that is, is something meaningful in Pascal. Um, and decided then to study computer science and make programming software my professional career so i went to rostock in in um, 1995 
to study computer science there. That's in northern Germany, quite far away from my hometown. But that was also a bit part of the idea, getting a bit out of it. Um, and that's where I ultimately, as part of a summer intern job, um, got to know and to use Qt in a very early version that was in the late 90s um, or in the yeah 97, 98, perhaps. Um, I think it was a Qt version before 1.0 or at least very soon after. Um, one of the research institutions institutions there started to use it for um, some UI development. And uh, that was also, to be honest, that was my first real exposure to the concept of open source software, not so much as a cultural and political perhaps movement, but rather the fact that I could look at the, at the source code of Qt um, was um, interesting and, and uh, enlightening and, and quite a revelation for me. Um, went then to Norway ultimately to do an internship myself at the uh, at, at Trolltech back in the days, which was very lucky for me in 2000 to be able to do that as a support engineer. Um, and since I had grown up with Windows and with you know the software you get when you buy a computer, um, yeah, I was the first and for a long time only software engineer or support engineer working on Qt on Windows full time. Um, getting things to build, uh, implementing a couple of things, fixing a, a number of bugs, obviously, uh, here and there. So um, in, as part of that role, touching a lot of different parts of Qt, developing a couple of frameworks that are to some degree still part of Qt, um, like, like Active Qt, for instance, uh, very Windows specific at the days, um, but by and large responsible for the support organization, customer support organization in, in Trolltech. Um, and then, yeah, the, the rest is perhaps known history. We got acquired by Nokia in 2008, and I decided that that might be a good moment to move into a different role within the organization. Um, so I um, stepped into a program management role, which is much more about coordinating different projects and activities and so forth. And as part of that change, I really um, lost um, touch with software engineering. I was quite busy in other things, traveling and meetings and, and coordination and so forth. Um, and there was less and less work on, on software happening. So I decided 2011 to leave Nokia. Um, yeah, I worked in different startups and different companies and different large companies in the meantime then until 2018 when I came back to um, the Qt company. Because you didn't like working in management. If I liked working in management? Oh, exactly. I mean, you, 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 you left uh, Nokia because you didn't like working in management. Is that correct? I didn't like working only in management in a very large company. And I also saw the writing on the wall in Nokia that this whole, um, the change that happened when, when Stephen Elop, for instance, took over the helm at Nokia. Yeah, right. I didn't, I didn't uh, quite see my role in that. And I didn't quite see that this is going to be the right thing for, for the technology. Um, so I decided to I'll try something else after 11 years in the same team, basically. That was very really foresightful of you because everybody knows what happened then, don't <laughs> we? <laughs> exactly. Well, it was it was pretty obvious. It was pretty obvious. Exactly. Was, it well, didn't take much of a a few a few months into Stephen Elop's uh, a few months, maybe not even a few months, but a few weeks into Stephen Elop's uh, tenure. It was pretty clear where where they were taking things. Okay, cool. Um, so, um, Peter, you joined the company uh, quite recently. I think you said uh, six months, uh, March or something like that is when you started, right? Yeah, exactly. March, six months. So, um, I read that you did quite a lot of things uh, before, including raising money for an African nonprofit. Is that correct? Yep. Um, so, I also work on a side project. Uh, mm -hmm. So at a cute company, I have my full-time job, and I also work on a side project, which is called Light Up Impact. And we actually, last year, around December, beginning of January, we were running this fundraiser uh, for East African social organizations. Right. And we were able to fundraise, um, how much was that? But it was like over 4,000 euros right. in a month or so. And uh, with that money, we were able to uh, help those uh, local projects. So we did not lead those projects by any means. We actually what, 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 supported what kind, them. 
sorry, what kind of projects are we talking about? Yep, so there are many projects going uh, going on there. So, for example, there's one organization called Activate Action, and they um, promote awareness, uh, also to lessen stigma towards HIV. And uh, they also run programs not only for uh, people who uh, might have gotten a positive test, but also for prevention and uh, all the awareness program. There are all patients that focus on economic empowerment of women. So they run, they were, they run um, professional uh, programs. Uh, I would call them professional programs in which they teach them some skills, for example, so they are able to contribute um, to their housing income, or maybe they are the, the only one, the only one, uh, the only ones in their um, family contributing financially. So, yeah, there there are many other projects there. And and uh, as a community manager at, at Cube, uh, do you find that that some of the skills that you are developing in one in one place are transferable to the other? Uh, I mean, for example, uh, I. I, I mean, this is, I think this is no secret, but in the, the free open source world and technological world in general, the matter of diversity is a bit problematic. We have uh, lots of white uh, male mm, engineers and not so many of anything else. Uh, uh, do these skills that you, you develop in one place help you in the other, for example, to promote diversity? And if so, how? Yes, uh, that's a very good question. I think there are definitely a lot of transferable skills there. Uh, on the um, on the Light Up Impact project, I work as a social media and community manager. So there are obvious transferable skills and some that are not so obvious, uh, mm -hmm. as you're, you're asking. So, for example, one of the things as a community manager that we have to be quite aware of is that people join the conversation, people contribute, people give feedback, people come to the events. But we also pay attention to, for example, why did some people not come to the event? Uh, why are people not joining the, the table of discussions? Or even if people are joining the table of discussions, um, why are they not speaking? You know, so this is something that really has to do with, as you mentioned, diversity and inclusion. And uh, it's definitely on my plans because I do see the our community, or at least the people who are more vocal, or who attend the events, or who come talk to me, they are usually white uh, male, white males, uh, and I would like to see more diversity, right? I would like to see people from not only um, gender diversity or uh, migration background, but also uh, where are those people? Usually we get a lot of uh, response from US, Europe, but what about Eastern Europe? What about the African continent? What about South America? Um, actually, we have a vibrant, a vibrant kids community in South America, uh, just mentioning. Um, or for example, what about Asia Pacific folks? Uh, where are they? Because um, we do have a lot of, um, our numbers, let's say in, in China, for example, India, they are quite high. So people are using cute there. And I think that's something I don't think I'm sure of it. Uh, I'm sure that that's something that we'll be tackling on soon because I really think our community should be uh, more well connected and also what can, not only what can they contribute to the community, but what can we learn from them? What are they doing there? Uh, is there something we are not seeing here that they are? So, yeah. Um, it, but it is true that, that, that for example, uh, uh, in Brazil, for example, you have a, a, a cute con, which I, I am not aware that there is, apart from the one in Europe, there's only one other, and that's the, in Brazil. I, that is correct, right? I mean, there's no other cute con in, in other places of the world. so. In Brazil, you're doing okay. Yeah, and the, th and the thing is, not only uh, if we have them, but 
are we promoting them or like are people even aware that they exist because maybe they even uh have other local meetups going on or other events happening around the world but maybe you're just not aware of it and that's one of my worries that we really need to be out there and be and be and be open and say hey please contact us let us know and at the same time we try to identify those groups and to build those bridges that maybe are not here yet in, uh, Booker, in in a similar in a similar uh, on a similar topic um you uh, speak uh, often of um or at least uh, write often about the how part of your role is to motivate and and develop a vocation uh, amongst the developers you work with um how do you do that and um do you find that different um uh in the, also touching on the matter of diversity do you find that different groups have different ways of being motivated or when developing their vocation for programming because you talk about you talk about programming as if it were a thing vocational for you you talk about how it is related to art and things like that how do you do that and how and how do you think um there are some people that that may be motivated one way and other people other groups of people that may be motivated another way do you find that so motivation of people um how do i do that i mean yeah i'm i'm a i'm a personal manager with with line responsibility and all that stuff but what i've always appreciated about working in the cute company is that we have um people in the in the organization that want to build good technology and mm -hmm. want to solve technical problems so there is an internal drive there is an intrinsic motivation that is already there um one could argue that perhaps that exposes us to some selection bias in that we don't maybe um appreciate that somebody could do a lot of good for our technology if all they want to do is have a job in software engineering so yes all else being equal we would perhaps prioritize or prefer somebody to join the company that that convinces us that this is more than just a job um but yeah that makes it of course then easier ultimately for us as an organization to make sure that that people are motivated to solve the problems that we are seeing ahead of ourselves and then really the the, the challenge and the task for the manager is to make sure that everybody knows where we are trying to go what we are trying to do what's important um and then get out of the way unless uh, unless uh, there is some you know help needed to to remove roadblocks you know the, the famous quote of don't just uh, don't just do something stand around uh, that's a good good way of managing people that have a lot of um, intrinsic motivation um and then of course being part of that team and being part of the of the of the development um as far as diversity and inclusion and and um, different groups is concerned, I do believe that it's extremely important that the technology of the future is built by people with different backgrounds, different experiences, different perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, and again, one of the things I have always enjoyed working in the Qt company is how international the organization is. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't necessarily, we are a sausage party. We are male to a very large degree in the R&D organization we are primarily white at least as far as um oslo and the european r d offices is concerned it's not it's not a hundred percent um but it is very clearly in a certain corner of the democratic demographic spectrum um nevertheless there are people with different backgrounds and very different backgrounds um we have a very international organization in oslo with i think we have 20 different nations in a team of 50. so that's pretty that's fun to work in for me as a colleague um because it's interesting to talk to different people with different backgrounds and different expectations and of course also it makes it interesting from a being part of a, a team with a special responsibility of being the the leader and the manager in the sense of yes people respond differently and have different expectations and maybe different requirements we have a couple of women on the team and it is not a very big secret that maybe they they will need different um encouragement to put themselves forward in certain meetings to present their stuff to feel confident that it's safe to show what they have done we have been very lucky with the people that we have in that respect but it's definitely something to be aware of also during interviews for instance during the recruiting process to not just 
try to apply a cookie cutter and assume that we are looking for more people like ourselves, but that mm -hmm. we also need to respond to the to the notion that people come with different different uh, opportunities that have gotten them to the position where they apply for a job in the cute company. And then, you know, encouraging that and, and discovering that is important. Okay, that brings up a, a, an interesting question. If uh, somebody would like to work for the cute company, uh, what what would your what would you look at first? What would your ideal candidate look like? I mean, would you look at the qualifications, uh, the GitHub repository? What would you look at first? When I read this TV, I look for a couple of keywords that tell me that this person has tried to solve interesting problems and finds it interesting to use software to solve problems. Right. And whether they are using C++ or not, of course, again, all else being equal, we are a C++ shop first and foremost. So having C++ experience um, is, uh, of course, getting you a bit closer to the top of the pile than if you are talking about different technologies. But it, it also needs to be the technologies and the problem space in which we are in. With Qt, you can work on a lot of different things um, in the in the computer scientists or computer science space. But if you if if your CV tells me that you have been spending all your all your professional or even your educational life with building um, full stack web applications, then there is very little overlap between those two things. So there are a couple of a couple of um, things that we look at and that we you know use to prioritize candidates. And then in the conversation that we have as, um, as part of the screening interview or as part of the first interview, um, what I look for is has the person shown any interest in what we are actually doing? Have they done a bit of research perhaps on what is cute? What is the cute company? It's not exactly hard to find out what all of that is, even though it can be very confusing perhaps, but at least having a, a reasonably educated guess on what we are doing and what problems we are solving. That helps a lot. And then having a conversation about a couple of um, basic R&D, computer science, uh, software engineering problems that I believe somebody who's working on that kind of technology that we are building should at least have a relationship to. I don't need people to explain how a binary search tree works in detail, but at least being able to relate to the problem of solving a search problem using binary search and seeing the benefits and seeing the trade-offs. That's a good conversation to have. Okay, going back to, to, to Pedro, uh, you are uh, the new community manager, social media, I guess, communication guy in general now. When, when we talk about um, um, uh, stimulating the, com the cute community, does that include the people at KDE too? Because KDE is, kind of, is a, a free software community. They use Qt, it is sort of like famous because it uses Qt. Do, do, do your responsibilities kind of cover, <laughs> cover us as well? Yes. So uh, just to clarify, I'm not responsible for social media at the good company. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I have, have a, a channel communication with social media, but I'm not responsible. I don't own it. Uh, but yeah, answer your question. That's uh, the scope of my job includes KDE because I guess, I mean, I don't guess. I know uh, how much of uh, history. Cute and KD, they share. Sorry, my phone's just reacting to my voice. Oh, the, yeah, technology. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, definitely the scope of my job includes the KD community as uh, there is a lot of uh, share between the Qt company, the KD, the K KD, and the Qt project. And uh, that's something that I would really like to strengthen would love the cute, the cute, yeah, the cute, uh, the KD community to understand that uh, I'm here to understand what you need, what your video also is, and how we can collaborate for a shared future. So that's really my vision. And I think the KD Academy event will be an awesome opportunity to meet those people and, you know, face to face getting the conversation and understand that uh, we can actually collaborate and uh, how can we do that so yep 
And uh, okay, so now we're moving into the KDE slash Qt uh, area of the of the conversation, where I'm going to ask you some questions about that came through from people I asked to to submit questions. Um, I have a question for Volker, uh, which is about: Are you aware of the KDE Echo project? No, I'm not actually. No, KDE Echo. Okay. So uh, just I, I will briefly explain it, and then I uh, the then I project by Joseph. That's correct, uh, Joseph. Oh, Joseph, I am. I am you aware. you are. Okay, so uh, then it's a question for both of you then. So the KD Echo project is an attempt to bring, um, let's say, environmental responsibility to the development of software. So what what we are doing is we are trying to measure the efficiency of the code and see if it can be improved so it uses less power, less energy, and we can make it more greener. This is not only for KDE. This is a, a, a project for all, all projects normally. Uh, it, they will have to be open source because it's the code has to be audited and things like that, and you cannot do that with closed source. So, so my question specifically regarding uh, Qt is, um, yeah, are there any are there any projects we all uh, does Qt development include uh, or consider uh, improving the energetic energetic efficiency of the code, which would in turn help KDE improve the energetic uh, efficiency of the applications and the desktop, etc. Uh, is there anything in in Qt worked into Qt for that? So, from a technical point of view, performance and efficiency is, of course, something that we have made a business driver for ourselves. Mm -hmm. right? We we communicate that Qt, being written in C plus um, plus, being optimized to use the GPU for um, at least QML or Qt quick based rendering. We are communicating that that is one of the advantages of Qt over some competitive or alternative technology stacks. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, just out of a business rationale, making sure that Qt performs well also on small devices, that is to a large degree the, the heart of our many of our technology strategies inside of the company and inside of the project. Not primarily or not directly motivated perhaps by ecological concerns, but really because this is what we believe makes Qt successful as a technology. Um, I'm not aware, to be honest, of any conversation inside of the company to um, look at a sales or as a, as a marketing pitch or as a, as a, as a uh, other way of communicating around Qt helps you reduce your CO2 footprint. Um, mm -hmm. or any of that, I think it would be a difficult message for us to get across to our customers today. Nevertheless, um, efficiency, effectiveness, performance um, clearly clearly is part of the equation and, and going also down into um, smaller device uh, form factors or device platforms like our work on, on microcontrollers and so forth. Um, is going into that same direction, but again, from a different rationale than perhaps eco ecology. But surely, surely it, it would be a good argument to make, uh, to add to already the good arguments for using good. Say also, you know, it's energetically efficient. Um, I mean, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm sure there can be, I'm sure, I'm sure we could, we could spin a story around that. Um, and I'm sure we would not, you know, make up a lot of, stuff on the way we could i think pretty pretty solidly support that story also if we look, look at competitive analysis or competitive or comparable comparable performance with different technologies also internally looking at this you know from our own we operate our own data center that runs our own ci system we are not posting that in the cloud for many technical and also business reasons um and even there you know saying it's um we save kilowatt hours by improving certain parts of the code um could be a possible story but again mm -hmm. um it's not been a focus for us so far uh pedro have you so you have heard about this this project have you been in touch with with joseph and talked about this 
Yes, actually, I've been in touch with Joseph. He has sent me some some things about it, and actually, we uh, we met face to face at the KDAB event this year, and we we talked about it, and it seems very interesting. And I'm looking forward to the effects of this project uh, on the whole industry, actually, because um, this is something that I guess we don't think so much or just in general okay how much energy am i using just to run this program on my computer um and it it, it, it could affect the, the whole industry as joseph was was telling me mm-hmm. um what if we really start to pay attention at the energy efficiency of uh, what is running uh on my machine or on a train or an airplane or and so on mm-hmm. yeah i think i think maybe Small steps can lead you to, to great results in the future. I'm really hopeful. Okay, next question from the community is uh, okay. It's a bit general, but and this I'm just going to throw it out there for both of you. And uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> and you just say what comes to your mind. Let's see. It says what can Q, the cute company learn from KD, and what can KD learn from the cute company? Either of the two, I really don't know if it's looking for a technical question or it's looking for a social question, a social answer, or something like that. Hmm. I think one of the things that we already also discussed at one of the previous contributor summits is um, fostering a community of contributors. And also recognizing that contribution happens on many, many levels. Um, we have a very strong bias towards those contributors that open patches and then changes for review and get it. We don't always recognize that um, there are many other ways that people contribute to Qt. Um, so I think that is one way where we as a Qt company definitely can look at the KDE community, also other open source communities. Um, one of my former colleagues from the Back in the Nokia days, Andreas Kling, what he has been doing with Serenity OS, for instance, is absolutely outstanding. And with how little, evidently, or at least apparently, he, he made that work. I think taking taking lessons from there, looking at that, and, and understanding, um, understanding what we can adopt there in terms of community building and, and fostering and encouraging, um, there, is, there is a lot we could do more and better. Um, also things like yeah inclusion, looking at um, accessible software, for instance, looking at like a project like KDE Eco and and you know really trying to take a bit of a broader stand in the software industry um, about what software means for society and what impact we might have as somebody who or as an as an organization that builds. Well, a fairly popular toolkit that a lot of software is based on. And that gives us, of course, an amplification um, with any of these things that we could do. So I think, um, yeah, having a slightly broader um, perspective there as well would be useful. What the KDE community can learn about, um, or could learn from the Qt company, I'll have to think about that for a bit. Maybe Pedro wants to talk about uh, what we can learn from the KDE community in the meantime. <laughs> yeah, sure. But as Volker said, uh, I'm actually very interested in the KD community as it's, um, I would say it's a very stable one and uh, it's it's not a new one, so it's been going on for a while. Uh, and uh, I would say it's a very successful one and uh, it's it's really spread around the world and it seems to be very well coordinated. So I mean, I understand. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, it's more it's more like well, an organized chaos. <laughs> yeah, I mean it, it's better than chaos chaos, I guess. But uh, yes. I guess we can definitely learn from this set this shared sentiment that I see from KDE mm-hmm. members and how can we activate this same sentiment towards the cute project, mm-hmm. which um as Volker just mentioned, there's this clear focus on code contributions. And this is something, oh, spoiler, but, oh, spoiler. 
it's not a TV show. Um, but it's something I really want to work on because there are so many people collaborating in translation and documentation and uh, event organization. Probably missing a lot of other ways people are contributing to the kid community that mm. I really want to support those people to so they not only can keep doing what they're doing, but they can do them better. They can, um, they can, uh, oh, they can um, target a larger audience and really get the results they're looking for and fostering also those local segmented communities. Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay, this one, okay, this one, I guess, uh, again, it's, I guess it's for both of you, it's one of the more pointed questions, so I just say, take it at face value, uh, it says, what would you say to people who are skeptical about uh, Q company's commitment to openness? This, as you know, is something that has, is, is the elephant in the room. Uh, it's been on many social media places, etc. Just, I know. Shall we reassure them? I think my, my knee-jerk answer would first of all be to say I, I completely understand where people are coming from when they look at the cute company with some doubts about our commitment to open source. Um, that is not really a surprise. And I'm generally rather grateful that we still have such a vibrant open source community and contributor community. Um, open source, we, we have as a company in the past, maybe not been very successful in understanding the, the business contribution of open source, because ultimately the rubber hits the road um, when, when we can understand how the needle moves because we have an open source community. Um, it's very easy for the business-minded people in the organization to put a number on the table and say, if we make this decision, then so and so many more million dollars will come in. Um, that is a very easy conversation to have. And whereas, whereas we who believe that open source community and contribution is essential also to our success, we, we, we can't really measure that in such simple, perhaps, terms that are so easily comparable. Um, so yes, I, I understand where people come from. If, if they have skepticism and if they are looking at us as a community as a company with skepticism and also of course within the, the cute project um, is a special project in that we have such a singular uniquely positioned player like the cute company that has you know um, special special privileges let's be honest but also a special um role in in amount of work we are doing and in amount of you know uh, resources we put into this um, so that makes it a little bit different from any other open source communities, perhaps. Um, yes, can we build confidence? Can we build trust that this will be different or that this that, that Qt will always or the Qt company will always be committed to open source? Um, I think words at this point are not going to be nearly as powerful or effective as, effective as deeds. So making some decisions such as bringing Pedro on board and, and we will hear more about his plans how to grow the community and, and how to support the community. I think if you put the, the, the money um, where the mouth is and, and see then how things are actually improving and what we can do, it's going to be much more effective than making promises or trying to um, calm down the, again, understandably um, strong emotions in some cases. Yep, just to reach. Uh, yeah, I think if people think like that, they, they, they're not so, so sure about the good company's commitment or they have their, um, oh, how to phrase it, but I really think we're moving towards and let's say, uh, maybe a new mentality or just, um, I think they're shifting a little bit. And uh, part of my job also is to internally get uh, people to understand the, the value for open source, uh, not only for the community, because there's value for the company. And that's something I am actively working on because 
it's very easy for me to get my plans and say we should do this, we should do that. The community will love it, but at the same to show to the organization, uh, okay, we'll, we'll, you also benefit from it, and to make those two meet, so we can get things going. But what I can tell the good community or the KD community is that we have plans that they do to actions, and I hope you stick around to see how they develop, and then. You can you can see for yourself because for now that's all we can say. Yep. Sounds very very good and very promising. Excellent. So uh, this is one last question. It's kind of related, but it's uh, from a more uh, uh, more looking for um, a more tit for tat uh, 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 relationship with Qt. It says. Uh, how can KD contributors influence the way Qt is being developed, you know, influence the path it follows uh, in the form of, I don't know, uh, features, changes, etc. Is there anything that uh, uh, a KD community member can do to influence where Qt is going? Yes, I believe so. And we have people that come out of the open source community and are not part of the Qt community that have a very strong impact in um, the direction of Qt as not necessarily as a whole, but at least certain parts of Qt. Um, like you have Tiago as the chief or as the maintainer of Qt core, which is you know quite quite essential. Um, but it is definitely the exception that people that are defining the roadmap or the, the strategy of Qt are, are sitting outside of the Qt company. And I think um, I, as the chief maintainer now, would like to involve the maintainer community itself more in the discussion of where do we want to take you, what's missing, how can we stay interesting as a technology, and and you know make sure that problems are solved that the open source community cares about, even though they are perhaps not exactly the same problems that our customers or that the cute company from a business perspective cares about. Um, it is a meritocratically organized project. So contribute, make yourself, build yourself a brand within the community by by, by putting effort and work into it. And, and that way you will gain credibility and authority ultimately as well. Um, I think that's a very laborious way of going about, but it's also ultimately a very effective way of going about um, becoming part of the, of the community, um, join the conversations. Um, there are a couple of things where the community, both of customers, but also the open source community in the past has felt like, okay, the Qt company no longer cares about X, Y, Z features of Qt, widgets, the desktop, um, and so forth. That might be true in some cases that the, the Qt company doesn't see that this is a business strategy or a business priority for us, given that you know we have many other things that we would like to do and only so many people. Um, working contributing to that again it I, I understand that it's a difficult and sometimes contentious discussion to have okay people put their time into developing a feature or fixing issues or supporting a new use case and then the cute company goes and sells that stuff yes that is the nature of our project that we have that kind of relationship but i think um i hope that there are also enough people that that can accept that as the reality that we have and nevertheless contribute. And there are plenty of people, again, that are doing that already. Um, we talk about the open source community, of course, a lot in this context now, but I think um, Peter already hinted there are other communities as well that we think um, can be encouraged, the community of commercial customers. If, if you as a company make the strategic choice to, to use Qt as the technology that you build your future products on, um, yes, it's easy to argue that that you pay a license and therefore the cute company should pay, should fix all your bugs. But perhaps it is a wiser choice to also say, we are investing in this technology as a strategic advantage for us, um, with perhaps sometimes with more than just, just money. And not for every company that is possible, but for some companies that's definitely possible. And we have a couple of commercial companies that are also saying, okay, we are actually having people in the team that are helping develop cute in the direction that is interesting and relevant for us. So again, um, there are ultimately everything comes down to participation and and contribution and putting the time into it. Um, standing on the sideline and requesting that B 
be it the community at large or the company specifically take Qt into a certain direction is not going to be very effective. Yep, exactly. And also, um, it's not only about the technological side of things, but on the, let's say, you know, on a meta community kind of way as well. So the community influences itself. So what are the future plans? What values are we going to focus on? What kind of events do we need to have more and more often? What projects should we sponsor? All of that's part of the discussion, um, not only contributions. So we have a wide range of things. We, we can tell community course, the more people engage, the more people, um, contribute to the conversation, um, we can shape the community in a way that makes more sense for the community for those members themselves. So that's also a very valuable contribution. Excellent. Okay. So I don't have any more questions. Uh, is there anything else you would like to talk about or mention uh, in your projects, anything you're working on that's got you really excited at the moment or or you just cannot resist not sharing with us? <laughs> <laughs> What's got you excited uh, recently, for example, Volker? What got me excited recently? I, I currently I'm working on porting Qt location to Qt six, um, right. and, and that is um, exciting to finally be able to respond to the many requests we have for that particular module. I was very excited. I was really happy to see what, for instance, Laudi, um, who is not a Qt company employee, but he's a commercial or he's a user of Qt, working for a company that's using Qt. Um, that he has been taking a lot of the initiative of porting things over. So that's exactly the kind of, of thing that makes me feel really good and feel really positive about the community being a healthy organization and a healthy bunch of people. That we are that we are you know seeing these kind of contributions and people saying I need this, I work on it, um, which is which is fantastic. So working working on this now makes me happy. Um, yeah, Cute location. Fixing bugs, improving Qt every day is uh, that is. I'm very blessed in many ways that I can be a manager, but at the same time, spend half of my time on in, with my hands in the code, and that's a lot of fun. It gives me a lot of motivation. Every day is an adventure, eh, Volka? <laughs> Say again, sorry. Every day is an adventure. Exactly. Yes. Oh, yeah. Some new, new, interesting uh, really of code to explore. Yes. That's really good. Uh, what about you? Uh, how you? How, what are you, uh, Pedro? That is that is exciting for you. So, well, I, uh, I, I think what I'm, yeah, I think it's kind of exciting at the moment because you're still new and everything is right. Yes, yes. I mean, I'm new, but I've gathered a lot of knowledge or a lot of information. Um, right. But I'm really excited, and maybe that's something that we're going to present uh, during our keynote. Uh, to need to align exactly right. but i'm envisioning this whole um i would call it a project which is how do we in our community to how do we how do we want our community to look like in the very near future so what can we do for our members what members can can really get from the community so we can really make make a make a basically a pitch of this community has value for you community members so it is it can be of your interest to to join it to contribute to hang out to participate in our events to apply for this program or this other thing and uh, i really like to see all those things that we provide tied it up so how are they all connected so you can really, you know, uh, visit a page and really understand uh, what it's all about and how you can engage and contribute and etc. So I'm really excited about that, and it's kind of like a bold uh, move. I mean, it's not really a move; it's more like a pitch, but it's right. a bold one. And uh, I really think I should at least aim really high, so you know. Uh, we get something nice going on soon. But um, yeah, I'm super excited about that and really 
the amazing thing is that at least the cute company has been hiring a lot of new people and uh, investing in different areas. So there are a lot of people I can collaborate with. So that's good because at least so far I'm the only community manager uh, at a good <laughs> company. But there are a lot of people I collaborate with and uh, they always bring me some really good insights. And of course, I'm always in touch with uh, cute developers who are really, really helpful uh, when I'm uh, dealing with the community and uh, our plans. Also, I'm not a technical person, by the way. Uh, I did not mention that, but just for the record. So what? I might get lost when people start talking about uh, programming, <laughs> but at least the framework I'm here to understand and make it easier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, folks, uh, KDE folks, you heard it here first, ready for a surprise during uh, uh, a Volker and Pedro's uh, uh, keynote, which, uh, I don't know, if it's, is it on the Saturday or the Sunday? Doesn't matter, go to both. So no, <laughs> they're, they're both going to be great. <laughs> so, and, you, and the one with Pedro and with Volker will have a surprise, something that that will blow your socks off. Anyway, thank you so much for sitting down with us. Uh, and uh, thank you for attending uh, all the questions from the community. Um, I guess you will get asked a ton more while you're at, yep. uh, at the event, which I think is normal. And we will see you there. And I hope you have a really excellent time when you come to Barcelona and visit with us. OK, bye bye. Thank you for the invitation and I'll see you in Barcelona. I'll see right. you all in Barcelona. Yep. Yes. <laughs>